Thank you, and I'd just like to thank Dr. Hart and uh, some of my other mentors here, Drs. Chapman and Anoskuyim, for giving me this opportunity to speak, uh, as well as the entire SSF team uh, for helping put this on. And so, as mentioned, uh, I'm one of the complex spine and peripheral nerve surgeons at the University of Alberta, and I'm going to be talking about cervical spine arthrodesis and specifically patient functional limitations postoperatively due to that stiffness or increased stiffness that they uh, incur. And I have no disclosures, nor do any of the other authors with respect to this content. And I'd just like to also thank uh, my co-fellows at the time during my year, a couple of year, years ago, seen in the middle there, as well as uh, a couple of the fellows here at Swedish last year, Drs. Eric Heyman, who's staff at USF now, as well as Cliff Pierre. And then, as I mentioned, uh, Drs. Oskui and Chapman and Hart down at the bottom there. So some of the objectives for the talk then, I'm going to be speaking about uh, increased post-operative cervical stiffness as a collateral outcome of cervical fusion, as well as the CSRS-CSDI, which was a novel patient-reported outcome measure instrument that we created, as well as its validation, uh, really looking at how that increased stiffness post-operatively affects patients' quality of life. And then finally wrapping up with a summary of where we're at with it and, and future directions. And so the idea for this project really kind of came uh, and stemmed from a lot of the literature and the research that Dr. Hart had already done uh, pertaining to this subject, but in the lumbar spine with what he called the lumbar stiffness disability index. And so it, it seemed quite natural uh, to, to transition that or extrapolate on that to the cervical spine. And I think it's also quite intuitive then, uh, thinking about the differing amounts uh, of cervical stiffness that different patients are going to experience post-operatively. And so these are a couple of the cases uh, of mine from this past year. And again, you can imagine then that the patient on the far left who's had kind of just a garden variety disc arthroplasty is going to post-operatively have a very, very much a different uh, amount of stiffness uh, post-operatively than the patient on the far right who's had a much longer construct and fusion done and how that might impact their, their quality of life. And so what we're actually talking about here then with respect to collateral outcomes and that are, are negative surgical outcomes. And this is an area of the literature uh, in which there's, there's very much a paucity of research that's been done. Uh, there were a couple of seminal articles that came out in the early 90s from Clavian et al. Uh, where they then broke down these negative surgical outcomes into three main categories, complications, uh, which they then defined as any sort of deviation from the ideal post-operative course. Uh, sequelae, which are then effects or conditions inherent to the procedure itself, and thus as a result uh, will inevitably occur or are unavoidable. And then also what they called failure to cure, which are diseases or conditions that remain unchanged after surgery. And so an example for, uh, of a sequelae, or what we now call collateral outcomes, would be, as I mentioned, increased stiffness after a fusion or pain after uh, harvesting an iliac crest bone graft, for example. And these definitions have obviously changed a little bit since that time and, and those initial articles. And now complications uh, are defined as any deviation from the ideal post-operative course that's not inherent in the procedure and does not comprise a failure to cure. And so complications, because then it's not inherent to the procedure itself, are potentially avoidable. And it's really that kind of middle section of the definition that uh, differentiates it from a collateral outcome or sequelae. And as I mentioned, uh, sequelae, that definition has also been updated. So uh, in one of the articles that came out of the LSDI, Dr. Hart had uh, kind of updated the definition uh, to collateral outcome being then uh, any surgical effect that negatively impacts patients but are unavoidable as a consequence of any given surgical intervention. And so from that, then you should take that uh, these are obviously negatively impacting patients, uh, that they're unavoidable due to the fact that they're innate or intrinsic to the actual surgical intervention itself. And these negative surgical outcomes uh, really become important when you start considering the fact that over the past 10 to 20 years, uh, a lot of remuneration within, uh, within the healthcare system in North America has transitioned to bundled payments. And so uh, remuneration is now really much tied to perioperative complications as well as collateral outcomes. And this has also spawned an entire different set of literature and research that's taken place looking at what sort of metrics we can use as indications uh, for quality of care and you can see at the bottom there this is one of the articles that's come out of our institution looking at potential readmission rates as an indicator for that.
These negative surgical outcomes are also uh, really highlighted when you consider that post-operative complications as well as collateral outcomes very much do impact patients with respect to their, uh, their outcomes that they're going to uh, experience as well as there seems to be a divergence in the perception of these complications and outcomes when you look at surgeons versus patients and ask them about them. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on with respect to our research. But going back a little bit now uh, to cervical stiffness specifically, I don't think I have to belabor the fact that uh, cervical arthrodesis in the way of a, a cervical decompression and instrument diffusion is a well-established management strategy for myelopathy, radiculopathy. But then as a consequence of that, inherent to the arthrodesis is potentially increased stiffness post-operatively that could then be impairing uh, patients and causing disability due to impairing their functional ability to carry out their activities of daily living. A lot of the patient reported outcome measure instruments that we use today, such as the NDI, the MJOA, they really fail to quantify that stiffness and its impact on patient quality of life, uh, focusing more on pain, for example, with the NDI, uh, as well as neurological outcome and function that way uh, through the MJOA or physical component score. And this stiffness outcome data could then really be important in counseling patients post-operatively on their expected outcome. And because of that, if we're then shaping their expectations of their outcome, and their perception of it, potentially then also affecting their good outcomes and their perception of that and increasing them. And as I mentioned, although this has been looked at in the lumbar spine, it hasn't yet been in the cervical spine. And so what we did through a modified Delphi process, an expert panel consensus, uh, was create what we call the CSRS-CSDI, so Cervical Stiffness Disability Index, again extrapolated from the LSDI, and then CSRS coming from the Cervical Spine Research Society organization, uh, as they were uh, one of the early organizations that really helped us try and get this off the ground uh, by funding the research through a fellows grant that we received during my, uh, my year here at Swedish and SSF. And so we had a panel made up of local spine surgery experts as well as external spine surgery experts from all over North America. And we sought their input as well as patient input and through literature review came up with about 24 different questions that we were able to then refine down through a five-step iterative process to 10, which you can see here on the far left, or on the far right rather. And so you can see then that the finalized questionnaire is made up of items and domains pertaining to uh, patients' ability to dress themselves post-operatively, pick up objects off the floor, attend to items overhead, turn and attend to multi-directional conversation, uh, driving, swallowing, as well as sexual activity. And what this then puts out is a score out of 40 that's scaled up to 100, where then higher scores uh, represent increased stiffness post-operatively, and as a result of that, increased in functional limitations or functional impairment in their ability to carry out those functions. And so this is an example then of a, uh, a question that a patient would see. So choose the statement that best describes the effect of neck stiffness on your ability to independently safely drive a motor vehicle, for example. And on the one hand, or on the one end of the spectrum, you'd have no neck stiffness has no effect at all, in which case they would score zero. Or on the other end of the spectrum, uh, I cannot do this at all due to the neck stiffness, which would then score them the maximum number of points of four. We then validated this questionnaire through a cross-sectional study, uh, phone and in-person interviews of post-operative cervical fusion patients. So these were patients who were undergoing elective fusion for spondylotic reasons. But then we also included motion-preserving patients, so disc arthroplasty and laminoplasty patients, as well as control patients in order to be able to compare them to presumably a group of, or cohort of patients that should presumably have uh, no stiffness or very little stiffness. And we then substratified these patients into uh, the different fusion constructs uh, that they had undergone or different procedures based on uh, their predicted range of motion after the operation. So again, on the one end of the spectrum, healthy control patients, as well as motion preserving patients. And on the other end of the spectrum, patients who had undergone kind of a maximum fusion type of operation from the occiput to upper thoracic spine, and then a whole series of different cohorts in between there with differing levels of stiffness. We then established validation of this by calculating a few different statistics or doing a few different statistical analyses, so test, retest, reliability, and repeating uh, this in patients at four weeks' time and calculating the intraclass correlational coefficient. We established construct validity through something called the Kronbach alpha value, uh, which is then a degree of internal consistency of all the items on the questionnaire themselves. And so presumably, uh, if a patient scores high on one area, they should also then be scoring high 
on, an, in, on another question or area of the questionnaire, and thus we're driving a similar concept or a similar construct throughout the questionnaire. We then correlated also uh, stiffness scores in these patients with their different cohort uh, to calculate responsiveness validity, as well as compared it to the NDI for discriminatory uh, or convergence, divergence validity. And so here are some of the, uh, the results that came of that then. Uh, you can see here, this, this is the distribution of answers from, uh, from the project. And the three areas the patients tended to have the most functional limitations with uh, after their operation were looking up overhead, as well as turning to attend to different stimuli, as well as safely driving uh, post-operatively. And as I was alluding to earlier, there very much is, again, a divergence from what uh, surgeons would have thought uh, would have, they'd have the most impairment with. Um, and although, again, we think that uh, some of this would be fairly intuitive in our ability to predict how uh, patients would be post-operatively, obviously not. Um, the surgeons in our group thought that uh, patients dressing themselves as well as picking up small objects off the floor would be uh, the areas that they have the most limitations with. The v validity parameters themselves now, so internal consistency was excellent, 0.96, almost perfect. Uh, test retest reliability was also very high. Uh, with respect, respect to responsiveness of the stiffness scores to cohorts, also correlating well, uh, in addition to with the NDI. And again, all of these being statistically significant. And those last two points are then highlighted here, for example, uh, in this graph showing on the y-axis average stiffness or CSRS, CSDI scores, as well as NDI scores, and on the, y, or on the x-axis, the different patient cohorts. So on the far left, control and motion preserving patients, as you'd predict, having low stiffness scores. And on the other end of the spectrum, uh, occiput to upper thoracic uh, fusion patients, in which then they should presumably we have almost no range of motion, scoring very, very high, uh, and thus being quite debilitated or, or quite impaired functionally with respect to their activities. And so just in summary then, the CSRS CSDI is a novel patient reported outcome measure instrument uh, that we've been able to, to create and establish, quantifying uh, stiffness and its impact on patient quality of life through functional limitation uh, post-operatively. Uh, we validated it through this cross-sectional study with respect to construct, responsiveness, as well as discriminatory uh, and convergence validity. And then this last point, prospective and external validation uh, studies that are currently underway. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Zoe Gogol Walla with the CSRS as well as that organization for really helping us try and get this off the ground and uh, incorporating it actually into their prospective database. And speaking with them recently, uh, they've, I believe, recruited and have over a couple hundred patients now that we've received this data on, uh, which will help us answer these next questions, such as how the stiffness score change pre versus post-operatively, as well as in comparison to the NDI pre and post-operatively. Um, from the LSDI literature, we know that there is a weak correlation between stiffness as well as pain, although it's not perfect. And so, for example, stiffness scores pre versus post-operatively would be expected to either go up or potentially stay the same, whereas NDI should potentially go down. But these are the things that we're still working on. Thank you. All right, great work. Uh, really, really very impressive. That's a, a nicely done study and presentation. Um, and and uh, you certainly carried the, uh, did carry it from design and concept through completion. So really, congratulations on that. Um, the, uh, so one thing I'll be interested is to know is exactly what you just touched on at the very end is, is how it changes um, uh, from pre-op to post-op and really what prospective uh, turns out to show. And what we found with LSDI was that it really didn't change very much, mm -hmm. um, which was a surprise to me. Uh, and I think in, in, ref in retrospect, probably the way I put it together is that, um, that the, uh, uh, the patients are, by the time they get ready for a spine fusion, and particularly a, you know, a, an extended spine fusion, they're just in so much pain uh, that they are really not accessing any mobility that their spine does have uh, on a regular basis. And they perceive uh, stiffness maybe, or pain as stiffness uh, in some way, something like that. And I'm, I'm really interested to see if we find the same thing in the cervical spine, and it may well be a different situation. But um, I, I, you know, I think 
every surgeon, every spine surgeon, when you talk to them about these issues, it's a, it's a question that every patient asks, and we've really never had the data available to give them a credible answer. Uh, so I, I think it, it will make a nice accomplishment, and, and I think we're a good stretch of the way there. So yeah. congrats. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else that, uh, Andrew, what do you want to? Yeah, I can just add a comment slash question. Um, you know, some points I made earlier about the magnitude and intensity of these surgeries and the frailty of patients. And you have to imagine, you know, someone that has neck pain, you know, this is, this is an outcome that we just haven't looked at before. And there's probably several other ones. And, you know, if we're only looking at MJOA or an NDI, and we're trying to evaluate if a C2 to a T6 is, you know, is worth it in, you know, someone who's 80 years old, for example, um, and we're using that as the only endpoint. We're missing, you know, the stiffness and all the other functional um, qualitative measures that, that your score kind of assesses. You know, I think we just have a long way to go before we really know the answer to see if these expensive, invasive surgeries are worth it. And you'll see a little bit of my talk coming up next that I take maybe a more conservative approach and try and do less osteotomies and do kind of more, you know, maybe leave a little bit more deformity, but do some things efficiently you know, trying to absolutely minimize my complications. And, you know, that's, I'm always kind of thinking about that with these, these massive surgeries. And, um, you know, when people just kind of are uh, showing cases and they're like, yeah, I did a, you know, C5 osteotomy on this one and a T2 T osteotomy on this one. And these are tremendously dangerous, complicated, you know, cases that I think the general, you know, spine surgeon should be very cautious about, you know, just jumping into, so. Yeah, and I, I think touching on kind of what Dr. Hart had also said, one of the other interesting questions I think will be to very much in keeping with what was done with the LSDI, then approach these patients afterwards and ask, you know, everything, knowing everything you do now, right. would you still go back and have this operation again, given that trade-off with stiffness, et cetera? Right. I don't think we're going to get that out of the um, out of the CSRS database, but that may be yet another project uh, mm -hmm. that would be very much worth doing down the line. Yeah. yeah, it's an excellent point. I mean, to some extent, they're almost competing outcomes, right? I mean, it's, at some point, if your NDI is not high enough, I mean, your stiffness is going to exceed that, and you make, make patients worse. And right. you know, yeah. how do we, what's the out, what are the outcomes to really evaluate that? I don't know if we, we know. No. Yeah. You know, EQ5D, maybe? Right, right. Yeah, great job. Thank you. All right.